My name is Scott Chaloner and this is the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. You join us on a crisp autumn afternoon here in the capital and I'm delighted to say that joining me on today's programme is John McDonough, Managing Director at Employability and Recruitment Solutions Consultancy and Training Company, Recro Consulting. Uh, John, thank you for joining us on the programme and welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for having us on here. It's a real pleasure having you with us, John. Um, now, your company, Recro Consulting, you set the business up in uh, 2009, having worked um, with Nest for a number of years uh, before that. Um, what was it that sort of motivated you to go into sort of employability and recruitment solutions, um, having sort of worked for a different business and sort of setting up your own organisation then? So just to just to clarify something there, Scott Nest was an interim role that I took uh-huh. um, in in, in twenty eleven when when nobody was spending any money um, on Recro. But what got me into this in the first place were uh, uh, sort of an accumulation um, of events and experiences, if you like. So my main background was recruitment. Um, I've done everything from entry level, but focus predominantly on senior search and selection across the public, private and voluntary sectors um, and regeneration and skills were two of the main areas, two of the main specialisms that I had. So I would often be um, recruiting for a, a director of regeneration um, for local authority, for example, and part of their brief would be a £100 million development that was going to do X, Y and Z and there would be however many jobs built into that for local people in theory. And I got to the point where I was thinking, this isn't going to happen. Um, the theory's fine, but the, the you know pra- pragmatically and practically it isn't going to happen. And I saw this, I saw this happen often. In the meantime, um, we had a client who I'd placed and he'd said, look, I've got 40% unemployment here. I've got qualified doctors who are stacking the shelves. You're in a big global organization. Surely we can do something. Um, and it turns out the company I was with at the time um, were major players in Holland in what was called reintegration, um, which was getting people back into work. So we had a delegation come over from Holland. We took a delegation over to Holland as well. And we helped shape the ask, if you like. Um, and we were successful you know, it's public money. It's got to go out to got to go out to tens and what have you. But we were successful um, in doing that. It was all right. It wasn't. You know, I knew there was still some stuff missing. I think all of us had underestimated just how much red tape um, there was involved in this stuff, and I knew there was something that could be done better. Mm. And then in two thousand and four, I'd met a guy who'd recently come over from the states, and my MD had said, "You two need to speak." And he was a combination of high, high-end high personal professional development, but he'd also worked with some of the most disadvantaged people in the world, a guy called Robert Raz. And, you know, what he brought was the missing piece of the jigsaw, if you like. Um, and I thought, right, we can do something here. As it happens, it didn't fly. But then a number of years later, in 2008, um, I was doing a piece of work for what was then called um, the LDA, the London Development mm-hmm. um, the Agency, I think, which is the precursor of the GLA. Uh, this was when I think Boris Johnson was the mayor of London mm-hmm. at the time. And long story short, this was for a director to pull everybody involved and get people back into work together in London. So you've got the great and the good on the board. Um, I, I couldn't get some of these people in the same room together. They couldn't agree on anything. And what I knew was, if that's what's happening at the top, it's going to be even worse. Um, it's going to be even worse at ground level. Having already experienced some of the infighting and the the arguments over, you know, bureaucracy and box ticking and who was going to count there and how come or draw down funding, etc. Um, so the stats for that were, and this was just before um, the banks had. Uh, it crashed as well. There were 600,000 workless in London. There was 600 million spent on adult skills um, with a, I think it was a 30% success rate and two thirds of employees couldn't get the staff that they needed. And I thought, this is absolutely insane. I was a bit sick of recruitment, to be honest with you. I'd had my eye on this stuff for, for quite a while. 
went on honeymoon, wrote the business plan, came back, banks had gone pop, everybody was out. They'd recently joined where I was, so it, it, it sort of gave me the push to, uh, to, to set up Recro. Um, so I did, you know, spent a few months doing research back in the 2008 and then formally set up at uh, January 2009. And there we have it. And I think it's fair to say that given some of the statistics that you've mentioned there, there is a real need to sort of have a company like yours that's going to hopefully sort of drive people back into employment, especially in sort of the aftermath of the uh, the pandemic, as we've seen recently. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I wish I could say we were in a better place, but I think really, even pandemic aside, I think it's easier to argue we're in a worse place. So... You know, the three elements to, to what I could see was missing um, that, that we look to, you know, the gaps that we look to plug, if you like, as a business, there's the, the consultancy pieces to help translate um, policy and strategy into deliverable reality. Um, and in the 12 years I've been doing this, I have never, ever seen one specification um, be that for a national contract or be that for a, a, a regional or a local one, and whether that's through DWP or a local authority or a combined authority, I've never seen one and looked at it and said, that's going to work. Um, now, you know, if the people involved, and I, and I get that it's complex, but if the people involved are looking for a solution then and their desire is high enough, that's exactly the sort of stuff that I would help them with. And what I've watched happen is literally billions be spent on stuff that people know isn't going to work. So, you know, we're not in a better place um, with, with, with that, unfortunately. Um, the second part of what we were trying to do was help businesses get what they need from the system. Um, you know, if you're trying to employ people, you just need good people. Mm. If you get good service alongside that, that's great. If the service isn't great, but if you've got somebody who can supply you good people, you live with that. Um, and we've got 1.2 million vacancies in this country at the moment. I think there was a report which came from, might have been um, the Federation of Small Business um, for London, or maybe the London Chambers of Commerce, I can't remember. It was out a couple of weeks ago, and that had found that two-thirds of businesses had no intention of using a government scheme um, to recruit people. And when they are throwing billions at this, that's a problem. Um, but the final piece that I've seen that was missing, and this is what, you know, this is the seat within the source that people talk about, is the ability to take, you know, all comers, if you like, the people who've been left behind, the people who've often been on all sorts of programs before and it hasn't worked, to be able to give them a paradigm shift in confidence, motivation, aspiration, and self esteem, help them understand how recruitment actually works, help them understand um, the, the employer perspective and and get them into work. And, you know, the challenge we've had over the years is you have commissioners, whether that's in a government department or a local authority, he'll sit there and say, I don't believe you because they've, most have never seen anything like this before. Mm. So it's been hard work to start it in the beginning and, and then we do it and then, we say, you know, well, come and see it. Come and see it for yourself. And the have said this is fantastic and the data supports it. When we've done stuff in London, historically, we're normally getting at least 50% of people into work and that can be young people or that can be, um, you know, a whole mixed cohort. It can be long-term unemployed, being, you name it, ex-offenders, the whole, the whole shebang. Um, and yet we haven't done any work in London since 2016. And now London's got the highest unemployment in the country. So there's a bit of an incongruence there, which then takes you full circle back to that consultancy piece, which, you know, sort of says, well, the people who set the essay question can't answer it. And that's where the commissioners, be that, you know, combined authorities, be that government departments, be that local authorities, LEPs or whatever, they need to sit down and say, look, hands up. This isn't as good as it could or it should be. Mm. Yes, that's uncomfortable, but you know what? Our desire to change and to make this better is, is great enough to do something about it. And that's part of what we can do is help them with that and facilitate that as well. Um, mm. But, you know, for anything to change, the reason why it's got to be strong enough. 
and I'm not sure, unfortunately, the reason why is uh, necessarily strong enough. Is it fair to say then that the system is broken because fundamentally the government is spending billions and billions of pounds on getting people back into work, as you mentioned, and those levels of investment aren't going into support that people are using, is it? I mean, we saw actually um, back in August that only 15% of the government's kickstart scheme vacancies have been filled and they only passed the 100,000 milestone in the middle of November. It's taken a very, very long time just to get to that point. Yeah, well, look, if we, if we go back, um, and I think this was maybe 2013, 2014, um, I gave evidence to um, the, the social mobility or party parliamentary group. And one of their key findings was the system is the issue, the system is broken. I think anybody who works within the system will admit that, perhaps through grit of teeth, or it might be a little bit uncomfortable for them. But if you look at... Um, you know, if you look at Kickstart, for example, and the National Audit Office report is out or came out um, on Friday, and I've just sat through something this morning with them and with Ursa. Um, you know, how many people could achieve forty percent of their target and think that they've done a good job? Um, and I pointed out, you know, this is where, and this is a slight tangent, but it's important because I think the need for civil service reform. Is, is widely acknowledged. Mm. And I appreciate that's uncomfortable for so many of our people who've, you know, thrown thrown stones previously, which is not necessarily the most helpful way. I think um, Dame Kate Bingham um, came out last week and was pretty critical um, of a number of things. And, you know, there's merit in a lot of that. I mean, she was speaking from a scientific perspective. I'm not a scientist, but a lot of the points that she was making um, resonate. I think... You know, if if I look at if if I look at almost any 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 walk of life, if I walk into a Costa and ask for a cappuccino, that's what I expect to get. If I get on a plane, I expect the person in the cockpit to be able to fly the plane. And yet, we've somehow got into a situation where people who are completely unqualified um, are given are given roles of responsibility, where it's it, it's sort of setting them up to fail to start with. Um, and, and I often I'll go back to that phrase that I used earlier: the people who set the ethic question can't answer it. So if you look at Kickstart as an example, and I don't want to focus too much on Kickstart because, on the one hand, it's got a hundred thousand young people into work, which is great, mm. but on the other hand, did it get those furthest from the labour market into work, which is why it was originally intended? Well, the DWP can't tell you. I can tell you the answer is probably no. And one of the reasons you can say that is. If you've got the people who are classed as unemployable, well, what is it you're going to do that then makes them employable? And they can't tell you. Now, we can, but because they don't measure success and they don't replicate and they don't learn and they don't want to disseminate it, what, what should have been, you know, what should have been baked into this um, from work that we did years ago, they, they've got absolutely no idea. So you then end up, and, you know, when I used to recruit and for the civil service years ago at a senior level, there was often debate around generalists or specialists. And the civil service used to pride itself on having generalists. They thought they could turn the hand to anything. And there was recognition in at least some parts that, well, actually that doesn't roll very well. Sometimes you do need specialists. In fact, often you need specialists. But then when you get into a situation where people don't want to be told or there's resistance or they get defensive, they don't listen. The next thing you know, to, oh, let's cover our tracks, let's do the, let's kick it in the long grass, etc. It becomes painful politically, but I think, um, and, and again, this was raised this morning, I think the Secretary of State for the DWP has had to apologise at least twice for misleading Parliament. It's purely because she was given the wrong facts. The Prime Minister at, uh, at the committee a couple of weeks ago, I think nearly everything he said to Stephen Kims was factually incorrect. Um you know, so if you get to the uncomfortable, and I'm, and I'm talking a lot about DWP, there's a, there are much, much broader issues, but I, I come back to DWP because they are the cornerstone. If that's where, if, if their responsibility is for the individual to start with, if you like, um, and to ensure that once they've left their care, if you like, their, their soft skills are where they need to be, they've got to do that. And the reality is they're not. And if you flip that to um, the employer perspective, most employers will hire for attitude and train for skill. 
So if attitude is the most important thing that most are looking for, where does that come from? Confidence, motivation, aspiration, self-esteem. And if DWP have a responsibility for that and aren't discharging it effectively, and you can't argue that they are, when they're not measuring the performance of, of, of the programs that they that, that buy, and obviously there's a, a lot of stuff that hasn't been measured with Kickstarter mm. and, and other stuff, you then got to say, well, what are they doing? And then you step back from that, and you can say, well, what are the Treasury doing? What do the Treasury think they're getting for their money? And I've had conversations with the Treasury over the years. They, you know, they haven't been close to this, but they haven't taken the action that's required. So I think, you know, what we're spending a lot of time on at the moment is trying to evidence the problem, so to speak, um, try and get it out of the too difficult box um, and raise awareness so that, you know, everybody, whether that's society, whether that's business, whether that's government um, and, and the people involved in that can say this, this is a real mess and we've got to change it. Mm. Because unless the reason why you're strong enough, nothing's going to change. And if people are in denial or it's all a bit too uncomfortable or, you know what, I've got two years before I retire, I'll leave that for somebody else to do, that's not going to get us out of the mess that we're in. Mm. And, you know, we, we need F, we need all hands to the pump to, to, to get through this. Mm. It does seem, doesn't it, that there's a lack of targeted programs for those long-term unemployed that are the furthest away from stable employment. I mean, there was a statistic that came from work coaches in Liverpool um, over the last couple of days, actually, that out of a caseload of, say, 125 people, just six of those are at a point where they're eligible for the kickstart scheme. So you're talking 95% of people there can't get onto that scheme. And so they're sort of locked out from employment opportunities. And so if the government wants to level up, the basic thing they need to be doing is sort of giving those people who are long-term unemployed, who need those soft skills that you've talked about, the very best chance of getting back into work. And incidentally, at Recro, um, you've been trying to do that through the flagship of the Life You Want programme, haven't you? Trying to get the long-term unemployed into sustainable employment that way. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that, 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 that's where we started. I mean, that's still, I mean, we've, we, we've, we've done a lot of other programmes since as well, but we come back to the Life You Want and that's, you know, that is still seen um, as the most effective program in the UK at getting the long-term unemployed back into work. And we will often get 50% of people back into work. Um, and, but, 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 you know, that's the hard stats, if you like. But the, 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 the stuff that's more important but more difficult to measure is... The, the progress that they've made when you see the improvement in their health, the improvement in the confidence, mm. the, the improvement in motivation, aspiration, they actually know, they, they actually know what they're doing. I think if you go back to, I mean, I used to recruit in this stuff 20 odd years ago. And there, there used to be things called the, the, the SRB, so single regeneration budget, there'd be all these employment schemes. Some of this, you know, some of this stuff was born in, 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 in and around Sheffield and, and South Yorkshire where the mines are closed and you've got ex-miners who are now unemployed and they've got absolutely no idea. You know, they, they used to dig underground. And now there's these things called computers and CVs and this, that and the other. So, you know, the, the business is formed and projects were made to try and help get, get them back into work. Now, without going into too much detail, if you look at, progress that's been made and what's actually changed over the years on a lot of these programs that's just little for a lot of them um, what I saw um, and wanted to do was inject um, you know part of my background was, was personal and professional development so I thought well what, what if we can bring the sort of material that will be the preserve of your corporate or your high performance sports teams or individuals who can afford or are prepared to invest in themselves, what if you bring that material to the people who are least likely to get it or, or have access to it and put a wrap around around it, mm. a recruitment wrap around it and, and help them into and, and help them into work. And it's life changing for people. Um it really is. But one of the you know the biggest frustrations that I've had over the years is we go somewhere, we do the work, people will come you know, again, whether that's a, a job centre manager or a contract manager or people from a local authority and say, this is absolutely fantastic, this is brilliant. And the idea is to do it again. 
and then they do it again and they do more of it and they do more of it. So eventually it's almost, a, you, you've got almost a conveyor belt of people who are unemployed going into work. Now, you know, that, that just hasn't happened. It's so stop, start and piecemeal. We know and we've had um, par- written parliamentary questions which have confirmed this. Either we pay not measurement success on this, which is extraordinary. How you can, how you can spend public money and purposefully not measure success is beyond me. And you know that 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 certainly doesn't enable them to, um, you, you know, look, look for solutions either. But we go back to, all right, what have you got now for the long term unemployed? We've got nothing. So we'll send you to restart now. Um, Ten years ago, it was the work program. What's different? Not much. Um, and that's where they've really, really missed the trick. But I think, and that's where the, the, there needs to be a much greater level of awareness and a much greater holding to account, if you like, because the impact that this has on people's lives and their families and their communities and the economy is huge. And you know, I would if I was going to be not necessarily critical of business, but if I was going to be slightly, um, slightly barbed, I've been trying to get business to put a shoulder to the wheel on this stuff for 12 years. And, you know, a lot of them want to sit on the fence. They want to be conservative with a small C. They don't want to put the head above the parapet. Um, and I think for a lot, immigration was a, was a convenient solution. And I've long said that immigration was the fig leaf that's covered the inadequacy of the employability skills and education sector for years. And obviously we've got Brexit, we've had COVID, mm-hmm. immigration's dropped off a cliff, and now we've got a lot of, lot of essential jobs that we can't fill, which is putting businesses and entire sectors under extreme pressure and risk. It is exactly right. We're seeing so many skills um, shortfalls across a multitude of industries, not just, of course, healthcare, but also the digital skills sector, manufacturing, construction. That's just to name but three or four there. Um, And like I say, this shortfall needs to be plugged, doesn't it? And we've got to look to the domestic workforce to be able to do that. Um, over the course of the sort of last two years then, uh, John, um, whilst sort of the pandemic has been an operational challenge um, and, of course, the full enactment of Brexit has also taken hold as well, um, what has Recro Consulting, your company, been doing on the ground to try and sort of mitigate that impact as best as possible, would you say? And what kind of impact would you say that your sort of work has had? So in 2019, the second half of 2019 became extremely challenging because DWP, which was our main client, now you never want your eggs, all your eggs in one basket, but mm-hmm. that's what had happened. Um, they basically stopped spending um, on getting people back into work, which, you know, really threw a spanner in the works for us because try running a business and running it well, when you do, you know, you're the best performing organization in the country and your client stopped. Um, so we went into 2020 um, having to look at a different source of money, um, which was ESF, the European Social Fund, which, you know, to be fair, we hadn't really been eligible before. And again, ESF is a bit of a challenge. It, it becomes more bureaucratic. It's tick box. It's not necessarily about um, the, the, the outcomes. So we had a couple of pieces of that that were lined up, a couple of pieces of work that we started with. Um, and then obviously this thing called COVID came along. So everything stopped and pretty quickly, you know, I could see there's going to be a huge amount of redundancies here. Yes, fellow, great idea. Um, but, you know, there's the pragmatic help and there's also the whole mental health, well-being mindset um, need as well. So I wrote a number of new programs which were specifically targeted for people who would have been made redundant, um, mainly due to mainly due to COVID, that could be delivered at scale and at speed online. Um, we also adapted the life you want to be delivered online. And initially I thought, is is this gonna work? Um, I was a little bit um, I don't know. I I, I knew 
one entire day, for example, we were going to have to just lose nearly everything we do on that day because it's all practical. Um, and, you know, you, it, it has to be done in a group, in a room. So you, you, you couldn't really transfer that online. So what started to happen is we, we eventually um, start running the likes you want. Um, and that worked really, really well. Um, and we were getting the results. We were getting the, you know, the soft shift, shifts uh, in people, if you like. But we were also getting the, the job outcomes for them as well. But one of the things we found is people were so grateful for the help. They really, really appreciated it. It helped them so much. Um, but also, you know, the whole, um, um, I mean, it's come more to the fore now in terms of people are talking about the great resignation of people rethinking the life, etc. But a lot of the exercises that we do were really, really beneficial to people anyway. Um, so that's, you, you, you know, we got moving with that probably certainly by July. And then we put out, I mean, it's, it, you know, the system DWP is is far more complicated than it needs to be, really. Mm. But we sent out the mail to say, look, this is a number of different offers that we've put together that, that they can buy. Obviously, they've got a process to go through, but this is what people are going to need. They're going to need help around this. They're going to need help on that. They're going to need this. Um, and work started to come through, I think, from back end of August. And then really, really come through um, quite quickly in September. Obviously, they were under pressure to help people quickly by then. Um, and, you know, we scaled up with a business. I mean, we've got a network of fantastic associates who we use anyway, but we, we, we were able to um, hire some people locally um, as well as further afield. And, you know, with delivering stuff, it was brilliant. We were getting, I think we were getting 50% of people back into work on almost every program that we ran. Um, and it was having a huge impact on people. And as, as one of the teams said to me um, last year, just before Christmas, actually, because I'm, I'm quite competitive and a slight perfectionist, mm -hmm. at times I want to get everybody to work. But she said, look, you know, think about what you've just done here. You've got more than 100 people whose Christmas is different because they go home and say, I've just got a job. Um, which sort of put it, put it back, in, back into perspective, which, which was useful. Um, we did a programme which had, I think we had to get through 449 papers in six weeks across Staffordshire and Derbyshire, actually, um, called Rapid Return to Work. Absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the others that we did, um, I, I, I know DWP were looking at this in terms of what they call a deep dive as to, what is it we're doing that makes us so successful that other organisations aren't? Um, one, of, one of the testimonials that we got from somebody, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase a little bit of this because this was a guy who'd worked in IT, really, really struggled, um, as, as did many people, but found that the process in the programme that we took them through massively helped. Most people don't understand the recruiter's perspective or the employer's perspective. This is even at the senior level. But one of the things he'd said at the end, um, teams such as yourselves are the true credit to the society, and I hope you as a business continue to prosper well into the future and that every single one of you always remind yourselves of how or truly how much you help people through dark and difficult times in life. And then he goes on to quote Nelson Mandela, the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Mm. And then it's just teams like you have a record what makes this possible. So that's fantastic. We, you know, we, we, we got hundreds of these, which is great. But my expectation was we come into January this year and that momentum keeps rolling. And it didn't. DWP stopped buying with us. Um, have you got a good reason for that? I'd argue no. And, you know, they're not paying attention. I think locally they know that we're really, really good, but they're going through a flawed process. Then we pick some more stuff up. But again, you know, I'm spending more time upstream trying to raise awareness with politicians and government and, and everything else to say they're not measuring success. Why would you not do this? Mm. Um, which links back to long term unemployed, which links to kickstart, which links to youth, put it in schools. You know, they need what we do everywhere and they're not, you know, they're not acting on it, which impacts business as well because business is desperate for people. 
It is, and the people are there, aren't they? Because there's a huge unemployed potential workforce there at the moment post-COVID that can move into various different sectors if you go out there and you train them. But say, for instance, of course, um, there's a national program that's only getting 13% back into work, and obviously your own program is getting 50% plus back into work. You'd think that your program is the one that everybody should potentially have access to, but because there's no real transparent data there on how well programs are doing long-term as well as short-term, you can't just tick the box of, oh, we've got so-and-so a job. It's also about how long they're in that job for and how they develop from there. But that data, measuring that success, as you say, just is not there. So when we think about actions that we can take in the future, that's probably got to be the first thing that we look at. Well, it it has, but I think... um... You know, what, who do we expect to lead this? Mm. Because, I mean, you know, this is the latest council we're talking about leadership often as well. So if you, I remember in, in 2010 when um, the coalition came in, I remember reading that David Cameron was looking at introducing assessment centres before he made the ministerial appointments. And that's essentially measuring people's competencies, you know, to have the, to have the necessary, necessary competencies to, to be able to do that job and a lot of recruitment processes do that it makes complete sense and I thought he'll not have enough people and then I thought they'll never go for it and sure enough a couple of weeks later the idea is dropped now as uncomfortable as this might be how many ministers for example and this isn't a political point because you know it, it, it could be anybody but how many ministers are actually qualified and competent to do the job that they get. Because what gets you to be an MP is not what, in theory, you need to run a, a huge government department. So I think you've got people, DWP is an example of being a revolving door. That's, you know, that's well documented in terms of however many people have had leading that mm. in a fairly short period of time. But this is politically sensitive. Is a politician likely to risk their political capital? Does a government want to do that? Probably not. So then you can argue, will the civil service do that? Well, the civil service aren't. So are they, are they not doing it on purpose? Or are they completely unaware? Or are they a bit lost? Or do they need to course correct? Um, and I would argue they need to course correct. And I, I would I would argue that, you know, one of the ways out of this is, is almost one big game of show and tell where people have permission to speak honestly and openly and say this is what's really going on and this is what we need to do to fix it. And an example of that, you know, we're not worried about petrol anymore until the next time. But that HGV crisis, when I've been working in an area, for example, such as the black country, and I've got people who were over 50 with health conditions, um, and this this is a particular cohort that, we, that we've worked with previously, you know, there's only certain things that they can or can't do, but driving for a lot of them would be an obvious option. Um, and I should be able to say, right, how many people fancy being a driver? How many people are interested in being an HGV driver, for example? Now, plenty of people said yes, but I don't think one of them ever made it. And the reason is the complexity of the funding and who's going to pay and who picks up the tab, etc. And I remember speaking to, I think it was one of the biggest HGV um, training companies in the country, so I'm saying, how can we work together? And he says, look, this is what needs to happen. Your person needs to get a job. Then they need to apply for finance. And I think the training was three or four grand. Mm. So they need to apply for finance to get that three or four grand loan. And what they're into is a, they're into a financial agreement here. Then they need to leave the job. Then they need to come and do the training. And then they need to try and get a job driving an HDV which in itself is always going to be an issue or often going to be an issue because a lot of organizations would say we want somebody with experience. So how many people are going to get a job that they don't want to do anyway to take on three or four grand of loan to then make themselves unemployed? And if they do that, they won't be entitled to universal credit or job seeking allowance or whatever else they will get. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And has anything changed now? From you know what we saw from a couple of months ago, no. It's somebody was telling me recently that um, where you know when the um, the people were 
who were the refugees who coming over from Afghanistan. Mm. You want to learn English? Eight hundred pound a head. Is it, can you really teach somebody English for eight hundred pound? Now, if you can't, you're setting that person up to fail. Um, so it goes back to who's pulling the strings, who's making the decisions, what is their level of awareness or lack of awareness? You know, what is their clear intention? What's their desire? And these are some of the questions that we ask and, you know, some of the facilitation and some of the consultancy that we do. And yeah, it might be a bit uncomfortable sometimes, but if we get it right, surely that's more important mm. than somebody, you know, hiding in the corner and fiddling while, while Rome burns. Exactly it. And that's going to be your mission, isn't it, over the next 12 months and beyond as we sort of reflect on 2021 and look ahead to the challenges of the next year. And if we think about what the next year might bring, John, just before we wrap things up on the podcast today, um, what is it by this time in 2022 that you would say you would like to have achieved at Recro Consulting, given the scale of the issues that we've been discussing today? Brilliant question. Um... I think the first thing, the, 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 the critical thing that makes a difference for us, but for everybody, is that DWP actually start to measure the performance of employment support programs and buy what works. Um, because currently they're getting game, um, which you know is, is, a, is a waste of people's time and money and it's not best mm-hmm. use of, of public funds. So... When they start to pay attention, we get a lot more work. We help a lot more people. We help a lot more businesses, which <clears throat> enables us to grow um, further. Um, and, you know, th- there's a twin impact. There's a twin immediate impact in terms of filling or helping with the needs of business, um, but also in terms of helping individuals, which then helps their family and, 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 and social circle, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that, that will be number one. I think um, the second area is because, um, you know, DWP stopped spending with us recently, um, that's given us the opportunity to sort of speak to the corporate markets directly a bit more. Um, and we're talking to a lot of businesses about how we're all, almost trying to flip the model about how we can help them um, to recruit, how we can help them retain staff. Um, Emotional intelligence is a big issue for a lot of businesses. Um, Social mobility is inclusion, diversity. All these things are interlinked, but I mentioned earlier, you don't want all your eggs in one basket, so it's it's given us the opportunity to diversify. um, And certainly, you know, we're going to be doing some, some press within the HR sector and hopefully beyond. Um, so we'll have more visibility of that we'll have more more traction in, in the corporate world if you like um, and when people see this in the experience that we'll, we'll want to do more of it um, a couple of other things that we are looking at and um, one is in terms of sport and starting with football um, you know one of, one of my teams an ex um, professional footballer um, another one of the teams a top sports psychologist mm. You know, my, my immediate question is what happens to all these kids who get released? Um, and then the next question is what happens to the pros when they get released towards the end? And the aversion of the life you want would, 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 would help them massively. And if you, you know, start in football and then you move it through from that. And then the other thing really is to be working with skills. And we, we've done some work on skills previously. We've got a program called How to Get the Life and Career You Want. But there's all sorts of other stuff we could do because we've still got a third of kids who are coming out with no qualifications. Um, in too many areas, especially deprived areas, it's like a conveyor belt to the job centre mm. or a young offenders institute, and it shouldn't be. Going back to the social mobility of PPG, character and resilience are the key determinants of success in social mobility. Some of the work that we could do in schools, both with the staff and with the kids, will transform what they do. A lot of this comes down to, and you know, but, but this is one of the messages that we've got for businesses as well, is being able to understand intrinsic motivation. What do people want to do? Not what do they have to do, what do they want to do? And once you understand what people want to do and they understand what they want to do, that's where that's where the match is made. 
And I think if we start early with, with, with children and schools with that, it's going to make a massive difference as well. Um, but, you know, the, the, the big, hairy, audacious goal, to use an American term, the system's got to change. And ultimately what we're trying to do is change the system, rightly or wrongly. Like I say, it's a long, drawn-out process, but hopefully over the next 12 months that are going to be ahead of us, there is some progress towards that massive goal that you do have within Recro. And to any regular listeners as well, business leaders, politicians alike, who may feel passionate about these issues and would like to speak to John about anything that we've discussed, uh, recroconsulting.co.uk, your website, isn't it, John? That's right. Okay, fantastic. It's a brilliant website, and you can certainly get some more information uh, there. You can also contact the business via info at recroconsulting.co.uk by email. And like I say, who knows, maybe they'll be able to uh, get in touch with yourself and assist if you are facing some of the issues as a result of the skills shortfall that we're seeing across so many sectors of light. Um, John, um, I've got to say, it's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you and most insightful having you on the show to discuss this issue with us. It is incredibly important, and hopefully over the, uh, the next year we start to see some sort of real action towards mitigating the matter yeah well listen you, you're right scott and it's been a pleasure to speak here and thanks uh, thanks for having me it's been a real pleasure john uh, do care do take care and stay safe with everything that's still going on and hopefully over the months to come we might even be able to catch up on the program and hopefully talk about how this mission is starting to come along more successfully than it perhaps is at the moment yeah fingers crossed Fingers crossed. We have to be positive as we can, can't we? Um, And to everybody tuning in um, to the podcast uh, today, if you, of course, feel that you have your own story of success and of innovation to share with us, then by all means, you can also apply to be on the show via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Um, To everybody listening in, until next time, take care and goodbye, and we'll see you very soon.